Hello, and welcome to SLP Full Disclosure. I am your host, Jennifer Martin, and joining me today, we have Denidra, also known as D Fontanet, and we are going to have a discussion about something that we have never had a guest talk about this, and it's really, I think, quite interesting and so important, and we're going to talk about responsible digital interaction. Um, before we get started, though, I want to remind everybody that this episode is sponsored by AMN Passport. We all know life can get busy, and that's why AMN created Travel Healthcare's highest rated mobile app that helps you find, book, and manage your next healthcare assignment all from the palm of your hand. AMN Passport puts you in the fast track to your next travel job. Receive instant job match notifications when you download AMN Passport today. All right, now let me tell you a little bit about our guest, Dee, and then we're gonna jump right into it because we have a lot to talk about. So Dee is a speech language pathologist. She's got tw over 20 years experience working with children and adults with communication disorders. She's worked in private practice, schools, home health, and rehabilitation settings. She helps busy, concerned, ambitious parents who are overwhelmed with parenting in the digital age fight through the distraction and the noise of their days and teach them to set digital boundaries for greater connection with their children. So welcome, Dee Fontanet. I am so happy to have you join us today. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. Glad to be here. Yes. And like I was saying, I mean, you have, this is such a unique um, subject that I just have not heard a speech pathologist talk about before, although I know we all think about it because we are communication specialists and, <laughs> it, you know, these, the digital age is here and yeah. all the you know, pros and cons that come with it. So I'm sure it's something we've all dealt with, but you've just really taken it and run with it and um, are really, I would say, an expert in this area at this point. Yes, yes. It is it is something that we don't really hear a lot about. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason why it piqued my interest, because I started working in my private practice and mm -hmm. seeing, I started seeing rather more and more children come into my, my practice that were on their screens at a very young age and, um, and more and more prevalence of attention deficit uh, diagnoses and autism spectrum diagnosis. And, and the, 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 clue or the, the key thing was that the parents really thought they were doing something helpful by giving them their phone or giving them a tablet because of the quote unquote educational content that the child would participate with. And but the parents really didn't know how harmful excessive exposure and screen exposure could be to to the young children because of the foundation of language skills development, speech and language skills, speech and language development, rather. So it was I was really kind of alarmed too when I just saw more and more children on tablets and screens, but then not a lot of talk to educate parents to make a better digital decision. Absolutely. And I know we're going to dive into this. Um, and oh, I have so many, so many things <laughs> I want to say about that. But before, before we get into it, I just, I always love to ask this question because I learn something new every time. But what was, tell us about your journey to even get to this point. You've had obviously uh, done, uh, worked in a variety of settings. How did you get into speech pathology and then to starting your own private practice? Well, that is a, a long journey. <laughs> <laughs> how I got in speech pathology, you know, I just always loved uh, communication. And um, if I go back all the way um, to high school, um, I remember feeling like, you know, I want to, I was always like correcting my friends and just naturally, but I didn't want to be a, an, an English teacher. And I didn't really know any other options that I could do in terms of my desire and loving literacy and communication that was outside of the education field. And so why my first year in college, I've discovered the field of speech pathology. A friend of mine had a friend who was a speech path major, had never heard of the, the field and talked to her and knew that, oh, this is my calling. This is exactly what I do already, <laughs> or at least some semblance of it. And so um, that 
started my journey and my getting my bachelor's degree. And so then I, I worked in the schools um, after um, a while, actually as an SLP assistant, mm-hmm. um, because I had my bachelor's degree, but didn't want to go right to grad school. And so I got married and had a kid and then went to grad school and got my master's. And um, uh, that's when I started doing um, more of the clinical settings and hospitals and rehab and and then opened my own practice. And so a um, lot of years of experience in different, different settings, but um, this has been something that's really been um, very interesting and very um, challenging too, because it's also so much stigma that surrounds screen time. You know, a lot of parents feel guilty. A lot of parents feel judged. And so it's, it is very challenging in trying to educate parents and provide them tools and tips and resources without the judgment, with them feeling safe and feeling um, um, secure and in having the conversation about better digital decisions. Yeah, I, I love so much of what you said. And one of the things that I think is so interesting, and I hear this all the time, I feel like it's such a common theme that most of us, including myself, it wasn't like, I've known since third grade, I wanted to be a speech pathologist. We didn't even know what the heck that was. And so, yeah. <laughs> so I think so many of us, it was you know through a friend or through a teacher, so, somehow stumbled into it. But then once we realized it was an actual profession, it was like, this fits me so much, but hadn't heard of yeah. it. So I love that. Yeah. And so you, you open your private practice and, you know, you, you talked on this a little bit that you started, sounds like, well, I should just stop and say, what was it that caused you to really decide I'm going to make this a primary focus of my private practice is helping parents navigate this. Or I should ask, is that the primary focus of your, of your practice at this point is just that helping them with the digital interaction? Yes, really it is. So I um, provided um, evaluations to the Social Security Disability Department. And so I would receive clients just to do, and I would do the evaluation, clients who were claiming to have a disability. Mm -hmm. So Social Security contracted me to provide evaluation and to um, uh, provide a report in the summary of what my findings were. And so I, with that part of my practice, I saw a ton of children and did evaluations with that part. It was really through that, um, that experience that opened my eyes to the prevalence of screen use, but also opened my eyes to, to, um, how little parents knew. So um, parents would come in and fill out the um, background information that I needed them to fill out. And it would be the obligatory, here's my phone, keep yourself busy, keep yourself out of my hair while I'm doing this. And then and parents would have complaints that their child was not paying attention or the child was very hyper or I would have toys. And, and so this went over like a span of a good 15 years. Mm-hmm. I started seeing it changed. And it was more and more like my practice, that that part of it, that experience. I started maybe when I first started with the Social Security Administration, maybe five kids out of the month of me seeing 40, maybe five would be on the spectrum or have some type of attention deficit um, concern. Within the last seven years or so, it's like more than half maybe 30 are on the spectrum or have some type of attention deficit concern. So I started seeing just how it was changing and I was thinking and I saw just the correlation of more children on their devices, more children um, not really connecting with the parents and, and playing. And then the parents also really seeing or really feeling like this is great. This is, they're talking about letters and colors and numbers. And, and so parents don't know what they don't know. And so with us being SLPs, we know how the brain is built. We know the importance of language development and speech development and the importance of building 
real neural connections through experiences, through playing, through talking and imitating, through actual tangible, meaningful experiences, how critical that is uh, for a growing brain. And we also know just how short that window is where we build that foundation, the, the ages from birth to three years old, really, is that critical, critical time for brain growth and development. So um, it started to really pierce my heart. I was thinking, wow, nobody's talking about this. And these parents, they're really doing what they think is right. And unfortunately, they're being bombarded by a lot of marketing by saying, hey, listen to this app and listen to this show. And this is for your baby when we know babies really shouldn't be exposed to screens until they're 18 months. And so I just kind of felt like it was a mission <laughs> more than it was a business. And um, I just started talking a little bit about it, educating some of my parents and I just saw tremendous growth in my students and my in, in clients because now the parents were equipped with real factual knowledge, education, and also tools and setting boundaries so that they can provide their child um, a, a more healthy approach to screen use. And, and then it just sort of took off from there. Yeah, that is so interesting. Um, I actually did some of those evaluations for a brief period of time, but uh, so I was just have, think, remembering, oh yeah, that's right. I did that too. <laughs> but I think that is so, I mean, telling of just who you are that you started seeing these patterns. And I also, I just hearing you say, you know, you have all these toys because I'm thinking when I was a kid or, you know, even when my kids were, you know, first born, there were, you know, the phones weren't as prevalent. And so you played, you had blocks, there's toys in the waiting room and that's what you did. Or even as adults think about we, what did we used to do if we were sitting in a waiting room in a doctor's office, we'd read a magazine we'd read, or talk right. to somebody. And now yeah. you go in, I was just at an appointment. Every single person in that waiting room was on their phone and right. you know, you're in the grocery store line, everybody's on their phone and everybody's it's just everywhere. And so right. for you to connect the dots, that's pretty, I, I think that's really cool that you saw, <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm seeing this pattern over and over. This seems to be the common denominator. What do we need to do about it? And, um, and I think one of the things that, cause I'm thinking also, you know, I've got a 16 year old and a 13 year old, and I know many times it has been, um, you know, when they're little, it's like, okay, I really want to go out to dinner. But in order to accomplish that, you're going to have a device the whole time. You're going to, yeah. you know, so it becomes where it feels like survival mode. Right. But then it's so easily becomes, it's very easy for it to become a habit. And right. I, for you saying that, that, that birth to three, you are so right. You know, I've, I did early intervention for over 10 years. And what I started to notice the last few years, D, is, and this won't surprise you, and we could chat about this, is that I would have 18-month-olds that were better at using and navigating a, the iPhone or iPad than, I, I mean, I was almost like if I had a tech issue, I would ask the 18-month-old. <laughs> <laughs> and, right. and it was, you know, and it was like, it's, it, the problem became, I started to notice too, that I'd show up and if the kid was on the iPad or phone and I show up with my bag of toys and here we are, we're going to play and interact and you have to take that away. Oh, meltdown. Yeah. And so I had to start saying to parents, please do not like before our sessions, they cannot be, they cannot have a device because right. I couldn't compete with I couldn't that. Compete with that. No. Yeah. No. And that's what I tell parents too, that once a child gets hooked on, yeah. um, Devices, toys, interaction, going on a walk cannot compete with the high energy overstimulation, mm -hmm. colors, songs, and that we find on apps and programs mm -hmm. and YouTube shows for children. Yeah. So, um, so I get a lot of parents that will come and say, my child's addicted. They can't put the phone down. They can't put the tablet down and I don't know what mm -hmm. to do. And, and so we, we have to actually kind of detox that and go through um, a process of providing those limits and then other alternative screen-free alternatives and really build a child's love for play, love for interaction. Mm -hmm. And children are resilient. They can turn it around, but definitely needs to have a plan and some consistency in order to turn that around. Yeah. And it, when you say, I mean, 
you know, I don't use the word addiction lightly, but it really, because I, even myself, if I you know, go somewhere where I don't have phone service for, you know, I was in another country last year and the phone service was terrible. And so I really didn't have use of my phone for days. Right. And in the beginning, it was like a deep, I was like, oh, what am I, you know, it became where it, you, know, you feel this anxiety. And then it was, once I was able to release that, I, it was almost this weird, strange freedom. I was yeah. like, oh no, I don't need that thing. Yeah. But there was that moment of discomfort. And I even noticed it, you know, with, with my own children, because mm -hmm. uh, true confessions, that is the one piece of leverage that I have. If I say, you're going to lose your phone, I mean, is wh whatever you need me to do. What are you? Know? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm you know, guilty. I'm no, go ahead. Yeah, I'm guilty. Just like, you know, so it, I see I completely everything you're saying is so true. Yeah. Yeah. And we all do that, you know, because mm -hmm. it's, it's a powerful device and yeah. we do use it as a tool for discipline, for encouragement. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually one of the things that I train my parents not to do because it does develop an unhealthy relationship with technology. Yeah. So think about whether you use it as a reward or you use it for punishment. Mm -hmm. It's putting the technologies, putting that device on the pedestal. It's showing, it's teaching the child, this is super, super important. Whether if it's, so let's look at it as it's, it's a reward. You know, it would be the same thing as rewarding our children with candy, with cupcakes, with potato chips and those type of things. So I teach my parents don't use screens as a reward because you're teaching and conditioning your child that, oh, when I want pleasure, when I want happiness, when I want something good, I go to the screen. But then also, conversely, don't use it for punishment because also you're showing, okay, this is so important. This is on the pedestal here that if I really do great, then I can have this amazing, powerful thing. So I, one thing that I tell my parents is to provide always a choice. And a screen can be one of those choices. But it shows the child an array of different things to work towards. And it gives them different um, choices to be able to... So they're not just focusing on the tablet. So the tablet device the technology is not what's on the pedestal. So may, and then also it shows them how important other things are. So if it is play, make playing one of those choices, make going outside and exploring, or maybe if you're developing a, a habit of planting or something like that, find out other interests that they like and that they want to do. I know with teenagers that can be hard because Really, their phone is all they want to do, <laughs> but it, um, you know, it helps to 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 open their mind and their broaden their horizons to really see what else is out there outside of screens. Okay, so hearing you say this, it makes so much sense, and it just never clicked. And I know that other people listening are going to be thinking the same thing. And you're right by giving it, you know, is using it as a reward or punishment. It gives it a lot of power. And then right. it just reinforces how, oh, this is so valuable. And we don't want to do that. So you, uh, I'm taking notes for personal <laughs> and professional reasons right now. So, um, but that you're exactly right. And I, you know, I'm thinking I, you know, did feeding therapy for, you know, several years. And it was always just like you said, you know, parents saying, if you eat this, you get dessert. Well, that's not, you know, we don't want that to be why they're eating to get that. Right. So it's, you're right. It's the same thing. And it just gives it a lot of power and puts attention on the wrong things. Right. Right. But it's so easy to do because again, it's mm -hmm. not talked a lot, it, you know, yeah. screen use, screen boundaries. It's really not talked about a lot. And even yeah. the shows that are on YouTube, um, there's no regulatory system in place to really help parents make decisions. So the parent, you know, parents are going on what they feel is right. And when they're told, oh, this is great. This is going to help your child talk better. This is going to mm -hmm. help your, your child develop faster. I tell my parents all the time, screens don't help children talk. People do. Mm -hmm. Did you have a screen to help you talk? No. So don't fall for that. It's a marketing ploy to 
advance that particular product. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so and and so one some of the things, some of the facts that I in research that I've done and I share with my parents mm-hmm. is really really quite astonishing. Like there's a re- the research has shown, or there was a study that was completed that that showed that typically a parent speaks about 940 words to a toddler without the screen on. When that screen is on, that drops to 170 words wow. in an hour. I'm sorry, in two hours. And so okay. this is just astonishing how much the opportunity to to have discourse, to to talk, to engage. And we know that young children, that's how they learn. That's how they attach meaning to different objects. That's how they build emotional and social skills. That's how they are able to understand linguistics and semantics and and put words together for sentences is through talking and engaging and coupling that with real tangible experiences. So when you have the screen on, uh, and a lot of parents will ask me, well, I just have it on for background noise. I just have it on, you know, just to um, just as I'm cleaning and just have it on. And so I have to let them know that if it's on, it still counts as screen time, even if your child isn't watching it. Because guess what happens? You don't talk as much, you know, as opposed to having the radio on. We'll sing along with the radio or we'll still talk over the radio. But it's something about that screen that when it's on, we tend not to talk over it. We tend to listen. We tune out and we just don't. And it's just the dynamics of having a screen on and the a program that you can watch, a visual program. Study shows that you just do not talk as much when it's on. Yeah. And this is also, I think, so as I'm listening to those numbers, we also know that it's repetition. You know, it takes, I want to, I don't remember what the the numbers were, but you know, hundreds, thousands of repetition of the same thing for that to pathways to stick. And so when you're going from 900 and something to a hundred and something, you've just cut that, the, the, your repetitions are way less way to the point where you may not even have any repetitions in that many words. Right. So right. that's another thing I'm thinking, especially with these little guys that are needing to hear over and over and over and are not right. getting that. They're not so. getting that. I have so many parents that approach me and their child is three and they're not talking and that, and then my first thing I ask is, well, when did you start inducing, uh, introducing screens? never fails nine times out of 10. Oh, when they were five months, six months. And you know, there's shows like baby Einstein. So of course Mm -hmm. parents are thinking it's for babies. And then when I tell them really babies shouldn't be exposed to screens until they're at least 18 months, except for the occasional FaceTime with, with family members, but until they're at least 18 months. And even then co-watching should be incorporated so that you can discuss the content that they're seeing so that they can actually attach it to something and make it relevant into their natural environment. Otherwise, children that young don't really interpret a two-dimensional image the way that we do as adults. They have no frame of reference to really attach it to. So Mm -hmm. guess what it ends up being? Entertainment. And we know what happens with entertainment that fuels the feel good system in our brain and gives us euphoria. And we want more of that feel good and 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 because we want to be entertained and then children end up seeking and searching for that entertainment or wanting to get that same level of of euphoric feelings. And and so then they want the screen more and more and more. So we really have to curtail the type of entertainment that our children are being exposed to, and especially our our little babies, it needs to be more organic, natural engagement as opposed to entertainment. Yeah. I mean, those dopamine seeking activities, I know when, you know, oh, a ding, a like, uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's crazy. And, but you got, you got, whenever there's that high, there's a low. And right. so a couple of things I'm thinking too, is that as you're saying this, how much they're missing with that learning, not only just the verbal communication, but how much nonverbal communication we get from others when we're physically engaging, whereas on the screen, oftentimes, like we are now, 
you see a portion mm-hmm. of the person. You're not seeing those subtle you know, nonverbal pieces that are so right. important. So, so and then, important. Yeah, and then I'm also thinking too is that I I read this about something else, but um, that kids what it doesn't allow them to do is to be bored, and we need time to be bored because that's when we become more creative. And we realize that I don't have to be getting these dopamine rushes every two seconds in order to function, but it doesn't allow them to have that feeling. And then, I mean, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I think then does they, as they get older, does it make it where it's more likely they're going to seek those dopamine rushes from even more unhealthy places because right. yeah. their brain can't be bored. Right. Yeah. Well, and that, but that's really what we're finding in children when we're seeing these attentional concerns, you know, attentional, attention deficit disorders, mm-hmm. because they're, see, they're constantly seeking um, that high, that dopamine hit. And that's not real life. Real life is not going to be entertaining all the time. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> if they're not getting that, they're being trained to attend while they're being entertained. So if they're not entertained, then they can't, they have trouble attending and they're, they, yeah. they get bored and they move on to the next thing and the next thing. So I post a lot on my social media pages about boredom is a good thing mm-hmm. because it fosters a, um, the development of so many skills that we yeah. need as adults. So critical thinking skills, when a child is bored, they have to figure it out on their own. They have mm-hmm. to figure out, okay, what am I going to do? And yeah. how am I going to do it? And of course we need to set an environment where they have alternatives and they're not recreating the wheel, but we need to give them a, an option, an option to find different things to do to entertain themselves. It also develops independence and leadership yeah. skills. You know, when your child is bored and they have to go figure things out and make things happen or play and keep themselves in, engaged. And um, that's really developing independence yeah. and leadership skills. Um, it develops critical thinking, you know, because again, they're having to figure things out on their own. They're having, um, they're, they're building a, um, um, autonomy again to, to that um, point of independence. So there's so many different things that, can be taught by a child being bored, you know, and having different things that they can use. Of course, we want to have some things that they can go to, but we need to sit back a little bit and let them figure it out and not. And I think as parents, especially parents as we are today, because we're just in a society where you get instant gratification. And if you don't, Mm -hmm. then you feel bad or you feel like I have a friend one time and we were um, going out to dinner and she had her her um, her children in this um, play playtime uh, daycare type of thing. Mm-hmm. But and so it was she had to go and get them because they were closing. And so she brought them on the dinner with us. And she was like, I'm so sorry I had to bring them. I'm so sorry I had to bring them. They're going to be all over the place. So they got their tablets. And I said, don't put the tablets away. Let them talk. And she was like, but it's just adults. They're going to be bored. And I said, but they're going to hear things and hear language and see dialogue and see back and forth and discourse and language rules. I said, we can talk to them. So she trusted me. She was thinking, oh, my gosh, they're going to tear the restaurant up. (laughs) And I was trying to let her know, no, just trust me. And what we saw was something very beautiful. We made a whole game out of ordering. We we talked about different foods and you know what would be different if we put um, some different ingredients and things. And did you know what this is? Did you know it's made out of this? And we t- dialogued about different things on the menu. And then we had our, con- our adult conversation. They colored and they played and then we, we colored with them. And she was actually so amazed how behaved they were without their tablets. We never pulled them out one time. And so I think that as parents, we just have this overarching obligation, I guess, to keep our kids entertained and keep them behaved and keep them occupied and not realizing that it's okay if they're not entertained because they're going to learn something and they're going to develop some skills that they would not develop had they had a screen in their face. Yeah, that is a beautiful example. And 
that meal, I'm thinking too, that was probably so much more memorable. That's something that kids will remember versus if they were on their screen, it's going to be uh, that, that memory is probably just not even there. Right. Yeah. And you said something too. I just realized also, I can't remember the last time I went to a restaurant. Remember it used to be, do you want crayons? And they don't, they, that, they don't you, you have to ask now. I just, it never <laughs> dawned on me. I'm like, oh my gosh, because that's what, that's how they I entertain myself do. if I was lucky. You know, <laughs> but, um, okay. So I want to touch on, um, you know, the, the parents and, you know, for anyone listening who may be, uh, needing this support personally, or again, as speech pathologists, we know we've all seen this and you've given so many really great examples and things to think about, about how it really does impact what we're trying to work on. So, when um, a parent comes to you, you know, what is that initial motivation? Is it, you know, did they say, okay, something's not this, like I, I, this is taken over their life. Is it usually somebody else that says like a doctor or a pediatrician or something saying, Hey, this is too much. And once they do come to you kind of, what's that, what would you say are the, the average age of the kids? Once the parents say, the help me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Typically it's about age three. When, oh, wow. And, yeah. And a lot of the parents that come to me, their child hasn't said a word. Okay. So they know that something is wrong. Um, and ironically enough, it's um, when you said mentioned about doctors, I'm being very careful because of mm -hmm. course I love our healthcare professionals. We are in healthcare as well, but um I hear a lot from parents who will go to their doctor expressing concerns and actually being dismissed by saying, oh, your child will grow into it. Oh, They're yeah. OK. They um, and it's and, and it just it hurts my heart because parents are seeking help and being told the wrong information. Um, and so um, I get that a lot too. parents saying, oh, I talked to my doctor and he wasn't talking at two and they said he would grow into it. Now he's three and he's still not talking. And so I said, no, no, that's that's, you know, that's mm -hmm. of course, children will develop at different stages and there's no clear cut, you know, way to develop, you know, but there are indicators that can give us an idea if we should be concerned or if we should do some intervention and intervention doesn't hurt. No. <laughs> intervention and, and giving more uh, yeah. attention to something this is always a good thing. So yes. I don't, I'm, I'm not from the school of wait and see. And, no. um, and so, but I have parents mostly that come to me at about their typical age is about age three Okay. And um, they're not talking or they are very hyper. Mm -hmm. um, they are um, aggressive and um, parents are just at their wits end, not really knowing what's going on, one, and then two, what to do about it. So um, so we walk, I walk them through a process and help them to um, set up their environment, set boundaries. And then I'm really big on education because I come from the idea of, you know, when you know better, you do better, you yes. know? So it's not that you aren't doing the best you can, you just, you're doing the best with what you know. Correct. So let me provide education and training on brain development so that I'm not just telling you what to do. You have the why behind it. When you have mm -hmm. the why that drives it's more sustainable. You know, those changes and that transformation is more sustainable because now you know why you shouldn't let them watch something for three hours or mm -hmm. you know why it's important to talk and engage in dialogue. You know why, because the how you know now how the brain is built and 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 how to make those neural connections and why it's important for experiences. Yeah, and I'm sure so many times you think because that's interesting that, you know, when they're coming to you, it's something is glaringly not going well. And I'm sure you're thinking, oh, if this, I always say life gives you toothpicks or two by four. If you don't <laughs> listen with the toothpick, you're going to get hit upside the head with the two by four. Right. It's always easier with the toothpick. But yeah. I'm sure there's so many times you're thinking, oh, if only, you know, I had, we had had this conversation, you know, a year ago. 
It's right. not saying, oh, it's too late. It's just, it's always easier before it gets to a place of, I'm at my wit's end. This is now a huge issue. Um, right. And, and I want to talk about your unclo- Unplug to Connect program, because I think that's so unique and and really cool. And and I also want to say, too, that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're not saying, oh, this is, oh, technology is bad. This is terrible. You're saying from what I'm hearing, and tell, again, t- correct me if I'm wrong, that it's not bad, but it's like anything, it needs to be used appropriately and in moderation. And you, is that, am I on the right track? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I, it's, I tell my parents all the time, the goal is not to be anti-screen. Yeah. That would be impossible. We yeah. need them we and can. they're useful. Mm-hmm. So screens are not the enemy. Mm-hmm. It's how they can be used to, you know, replace parenting, replace presence, Mm -hmm. um, to, you know, to, like we talked about for punishment or for rewards, you know, it's how we use them that can be harmful and excessive use of them, just like anything else, you know, can be harmful. Like I love cookies. If I ate them every day and a whole ton of them, that's not good. That doesn't mean that I don't like them or I shouldn't have them at all. So it's the same with screens. And so I, I, I help my parents understand that it's not to be anti-screen, but let's learn how to use it for one for our advantage because they it can be advantageous to use screens. You know, it has its uses. Choosing the right program can be beneficial. But, you know, all programs are not created equally. And so just because something says it's educational doesn't mean that it is. So with my Unplug to Connect, I have a six step process where I help parents understand, educate them and under and help them understand the the why behind the things that they'll be learning. Um, I talk about play, the power of play. I talk about let's build a brain and what that's about and brain development. Um, I talk about knowing your shows. So I educate parents and provide them a tool with tools to judge the shows for themselves. So if there's some of those components are if it's too, you know, too fast or there's a lot of overstimulating images and content. And I teach them how to judge that for themselves. And so when parents go through the program, they are surprised at how much out there really isn't well made for children. For it's, sure. <laughs> it's made to sell. It's not made for children. So what's going to sell? High energy stuff, very colorful stuff, very um, a song after song after song. I had one parent said, songs are good. We are told to provide songs and, and have our children exposed to songs. And I said, yeah, but if it's like songs every two minutes, then that may not be a good thing because now you're getting into the side of entertainment. Mm-hmm. And once think about when you're entertained, if you're going to a concert and you want to be entertained, do you want to hear anything educational? No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. You, that part of your brain is shut off. Yeah. You're not trying to pick in educational little nuggets from a concert. You're there. You just want to sit back and you want to be entertained. You want to get it all in. You want to feel good. So when it, that's the same thing with our children, if there's too many songs yeah, they they might be singing about a lot of educational stuff, and but the child's just gonna that part of the brain is gonna ignite where all they're doing is being entertained, and so um, so a lot of that is being discussed in my in my unplug to connect um, course, and the reason why I called it unplug to connect because I really believe that by human connection cannot be replaced. And that is the surefire way to help your child develop healthily, help, uh, have a healthy speech and language de- um, environment um, for your child by connecting. But, and so when we unplug, then we have the opportunity to connect. And that's teaching parents and also giving them the tools to equip their environment, their home, um, um, equip themselves with the tools they need to help their children connect on that level. Yeah. Oh, beautifully said. And I really love that. It's not, you know, it's, it's technology and screens can be in addition 
but should never be a replacement. And I think right. that is a really powerful way to think about it. Am I doing this as like a, a small addition to their life or am I doing, is what they're doing now replacing something else that is really important? And, um, oh, you just, okay. You said so many things right there that are just, I, 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 I like, ah, there's just so many important <laughs> nuggets in there. But I think the, I mean, I've learned, I've, I've been a speech pathologist for over 20 years and I'm learning things from you that I never really connected the dots. And so I can't imagine, I, I, I can't imagine because I'm learning so much from you, how much it just helps for parents to even hear about what they're missing when they're over consuming technology right. and screens. And that is, you know, you're in what you said, you don't know what you don't know. It's not, nobody's mm -hmm. maliciously saying, I'm going to teach them to have no critical thinking skills. I'll show them. I mean, you know, nobody does right. that, but we don't, you don't know that that's something that could be, you know, it's going to have a bigger impact later. It's almost like for now it's that survival skills, but right. what is the impact later? And gosh, what you said about that, I think, you know, if, if nothing, one of the things that I think was so just challenging about the pandemic period and I think we all finally got it, how critical that human inter interaction is because right. it, it really impacts everything. And, and as adults, you know, we've been through things. We know we've developed language. We have those skills built in and it really affected us. The kids not having that interaction impacted them greatly. And that's what's happening bit by bit when they're just consumed with screens, right? They're just, they're right. missing those pieces. Yeah, I don't know if you know about like Cliff Notes. Do you know about Cliff Notes? Like the the OG Cliff Notes, like from yes. my youth. Yeah, <laughs> what you know, now, D. They're now Spark Notes. You know, they're, Spark they're not. Notes. They're not Cliff Notes anymore. I was corrected. There's no wow. nobody knows what those are. It's Spark Notes. So I'm I'm you know so I'm a little old school. Uh, I told yeah, you. Me, uh, me too. I just celebrated <laughs> a milestone birthday. So. <laughs> So, but I do but know Cliff I, Notes. Yeah. Yes, yes. So that's what I told my parents. Uh, no one's corrected me, though. A lot of them, like, I've never heard of Cliff Notes. But no one's corrected me. It's Spark Notes. So thank you, Jennifer, for letting me know that. I'm um, here for you. I would, I would tell them, you know, like, when, we were, when I was back in school and we mm -hmm. had to do book reports, and instead of reading the whole book, we would get the Cliff Notes version, which would tell us just, you know, basically – the 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 summary the main plot you know and just the high level version of the story but you know the teacher the teacher was very savvy she would ask questions when it came time for that test that would not be at the high level mm -hmm. more of the underlying things and that you would only be able to know if you read the book and so that's kind of how I feel about when we use technology to really teach our children without the component of interaction really built into that mm -hmm. is that it's really like the Cliff Notes version mm -hmm. of language development. Uh, a child is going to miss a lot of underlying things to make those connections, make those neural connections if they're just using the technology, like you were mentioning before, the um, nonverbal cues and the social interaction, um, picking up on just different things socially and things that are not stated, um, things that are figurative and in nature, you know, that can't be taught through screens or even um, taught through programs, you know, that comes from interacting and engaging. So um, those are the things that are just really aren't talked about and really given yeah. and, and not told to parents. And so when I'm telling them different things about the shows or the apps that they're watching, um, they're like, I thought this was great. I thought mm -hmm. this was awesome. And I said, it can be, but you have to do some other things along with it and know that you can't, can't give your child the cliff notes version. Yeah. <laughs> and we, smart version. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I, it's so funny. Cause I said that somebody said cliff notes, what's, what's that? And I explained and they said, Oh, it's spark notes. Like, spark notes. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> so yeah. And that's a really great example. And um, you know, oh gosh, I just lost my train of thought, but I had a really good point. Um, yeah, that is, that is a great example because you are, it's like the depth of, of what's underneath is really what 
is so important and where we really can get so much information. So if you're not getting that, I mean, you're missing a huge, it's like the iceberg, right? It's like, you're getting some, but the big piece underneath you're missing. Um, so one of the things too, I'm thinking is, you know, and I love, and, and again, we're going to put all of your information in the show notes for people that want to go to your website and your, your social media. And again, you provide so much great just information and little tidbits. Um, mm-hmm. You give us little yeah. dopamine hits, yeah. <laughs> but it's right. good. It's good things. Um, what about is, is there accountability built into your plan? Because I'm thinking at me as a parent, I'm like, here I am. I'm like, yes, everything you're saying makes perfect sense. And I'm going to go home and I am going to need some accountability or I'm going to go right back to doing the things that I did. Right. Yes. So through Unplug to Connect, it's a cohort. So I introduce it in cohorts. And that has worked amazingly because it's a community of other parents Mm -hmm. sharing what they have learned. So every week that we meet, we come back and we talk about our wins. And Mm -hmm. I have a three-month version and I have a six-week version version of Unplugged to Connect. But every time we come and we meet, we talk about our wins. So if we're talking about, were you, I have a rubric that I've developed that parents use to judge the, the different children's shows that their children participate with. And so one of the assignments is to use that rubric and judge three shows. And they come back and they're like, I love such and such and such and such. And I thought it was awesome. But when I used the rubric and really saw what type of things I need to avoid and things to look for, it had all the things that I needed to avoid. And I never knew that. And another parent would chime in like, wow, I didn't even think about that. Or I didn't know about that show. And and so because that in community uh, environment really gives the accountability and other parents who probably didn't do their homework that week, they're doing it now. <laughs> they're like, Oh, they stay wow. real quiet and, on those meetings. Yeah. They're like, <laughs> yes. they're like, quiet, like, Oh, I didn't do my <laughs> homework, but I'm doing it next week. Yeah. So it's, it's, it gives that accountability because they mm-hmm. see the results. Yeah. They see the difference they see. And then they feel empowered. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the thing. Parents, we want what's best for our children. You know, yeah. we want to give them the best, you know, inherently we love and want our children to excel and succeed and give them the absolute best. So when they feel, when they have the tools, it empowers them to, to, to use them, to learn more. I had one parent after my three month course who um, went on and started um volunteering at her child's school and helping other parents with what she learned through mm-hmm. Unplugged to Connect um, because she was just, she was empowered. She was like, people yeah. need to know. People just don't know. And more people need to be talking about this. Yeah. I, that's a, I, I love that because I think that would help me if I knew, okay, I got to show up and I have to be able to say what I did or didn't do. I mean that, and, and, I am also thinking, you know, when I work with parents with behavior, I always tell them it's going to get worse before it gets better. If right. you don't, just because it starts getting worse, they think, well, it's not working. I'm not going to do it anymore. Uh, but I'm like, but that is like when the tipping point, you got it. That's when the kid's saying, I don't like this change. Yeah. This isn't working for me. So I'm going to up the ante. But right. that's where you, I think you're exactly right. I'm sure. Once they start to see, it's like, okay, get over the discomfort for everybody. And then you see those, the, the benefits. And then I'm sure in, wow. that in itself is just motivating to continue. And I love that then it becomes, you know, that's how change happens is people mm-hmm. do something. They say, wow, this is actually making a really positive difference. And then they tell other people. And then yeah. it does become where, you know, we know better, we do better. So, right. yeah. <laughs> and right. I was also... Absolutely. These other thing too, that is so is the algorithms now and how they, it's like, they, they know target me. Us. Yes. And I have a funny story. And then I want to ask you, uh, I, and then I want to touch on social media real quick, but this, every time I think about this, it makes me laugh. So my son was like five or six. And again, I am, I'm, I'm owning, I was <laughs> that parent and I am that parent to some extent that as probably not probably has used, allowed my kids to have more access to screens than I should have. Right. And I know better, but I did not do better. 
<laughs> and I now, it's but okay. I didn't know all the things you just said. But so he was obsessed with Thomas the Train. And I had, it was YouTube. And so I put Thomas the Train. And you know, it plays, once it's got that video, it plays anything. It starts that algorithm. Right. So I'm in the other room. He's, I'm making dinner or something. He's listening, Thomas the Train. All of a sudden, I hear a Snoop Dogg song. And I'm like, what? I kid you not. I go back in there. It is a cartoon version of Thomas the Train, Snoop Dogg song playing, and Thomas the Train is smoking a joint. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and I had no idea that I was like, uh-oh. You know, I, but that's the thing. Like, it's, it, yeah. it goes down. And just to your point, like, you think, oh, this is fine. It's Thomas the Train. Yeah. But those yeah. algorithms are... You can end up in places that you did not mean to go and should not exactly. be. So, yes. Yes. yeah, no, that happens, you know, because it's it's all a business. So yes. they know what we want, they know what we yes. like, and then they keep giving it to you. And, yes, and so that's why you know it's so important to have limits, screen limits, mm-hmm. um, and just not give free reign. Um, so you know, some of our parents, when you were touching on um, just how you have to stick stick with it. You know, when you're making mm-hmm. a change, you have to stick with it. We know study shows that really change is not, doesn't become habit until about 30, 30 days. And so I tell my parents, you have to be consistent with this yeah. in order to really see a difference. You're not going to see a difference unless you make it consistent. And mm-hmm. um, so I had one parent who whose child was really having a lot of behavior issues and behavior concerns, turning tables over and oh, wow. just being very aggressive and and she was like the screen is the only thing that calms her and so here I am telling her she can you know yeah we're gonna really work with only using screens like one an hour a day and she was using it like five and six yeah. hours a day you know hours in the morning to get her dressed hours after school when you came home from from school and hours before bed and mm-hmm. so She was very discouraged and thinking, this is not going to work. This is just too much. But she trusted me and we went through it. And by giving alternatives and really teaching her child to love play, children really desire interaction. You Mm -hmm. know, they really, really do. And it's us sometimes as parents, we see, oh, they really like that. They really like that show. It makes them happy. They're just playing and jumping around and and I have to tell them, yeah, they really like cookies for dinner, too, mm-hmm. <laughs> but we don't give it to them. And so this the end of the story, after going through the process, after going through the program and, and just learning different ways to engage her child outside of screens, um, she was telling me that even when her when she would have given her the screen, even when it was allowed, she was wanting to play. She was wanting to go outside. She was going to her toy corner. I teach parents to have a designated place for children to play. Like they need to see it. You know, they, even if you don't have a house where you can have a play room that you don't have Mm -hmm. to have a play room anywhere you live, you can have a toy corner. Yeah. And, and it doesn't have to be elaborate, doesn't have a whole bunch of toys. I don't really teach you have a lot of toys because you don't want to overstimulate your child yes. with toys. Yes. So you want to have a core set of toys. But she would start to go to her toy corner on her own because now she saw the benefit in playing. You know, she got a chance to play with mom and she's talking more and she's using her brain. And, yeah. And so even the children are really resi- resilient. When we can provide the, 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 the guidance and the leadership to help them, they tend to fall in line, but it does yeah. take consistency. And you said something that I think was so key. It makes them happy. It's a temporary happy. Right. It's not a long-term happy. By giving them those other skills, you create a long-term happy. So I think that's key. Right. If you start to feel that yearning, like, oh, I want to give it, that's temporary. It's temporary happy. It's this temporary. is not... Okay. And before we wrap up, I really want your opinion on this last thing. What do you tell parents about social media and when and how, because I know, you know, everything that I read or know, and again, with my own kids, with TikTok and all this stuff, it's like, I know it's so, I, I know it's not good for them in many aspects, but what do you tell parents when they say, what about social media? 
Yeah, great question. You know, because the typical ages that I target to work with are from birth to six. Mm -hmm. But I get parents who have different uh, children in different ages. So they may have a two-year-old, but they have an 11-year-old and a 15-year-old. And so they're asking me questions about them as well. And so the biggest thing, and, and especially like introducing social media to children, I don't really get into an age uh, okay. because it's not the age that should drive it. It's the behaviors and, and what they're displaying in terms of their maturity. And so you know, you may hear, I've done research, and so there's a lot that, that really points to maybe the age of eight that you can start introducing social media. And I tell my parents, no, you really need to ask them a couple of questions. How well are they with using technology right now? I mean, maybe tablets, you know, how mm -hmm. well are they? So they're not on social media, but maybe they have downloaded apps and they've used yeah. tablets. Are they sneaking to use it after you tell them not to? Are they open with communication? Are they telling you things that happened at school? Um, is there an open dialogue that you've developed as a parent to share things and share concerns? Because when you start that social media portal, when you open that, it opens a whole world. And yes. you want to make sure your child is mature to handle that world. And the only way you know that is by looking at some of their behaviors now, not later, not after you've introduced social media, yeah. you've given them rules to follow. How well are they following the rules now before the introduction mm -hmm. of social media? So it's really key to know the maturity level of your child and how open they are to dialogue and expressing things, sharing things with you, how honest they are too on the boundaries you've already given. And, and that should be the guide. That is a great point because you're exactly right. You know, you can have five, eight year olds in a room. They're not all going to be the same. And so I think that is a really good point that it doesn't, it's not this one size fits all that at this age, everybody, yes. you're right, because yeah. there's some eight year olds that act like five year olds. And there's some eight year olds that are at the level of a 10 year old. Um, right. And do you recommend having, you know, parental controls on these where they can't go and start to, cause it is Absolutely. these rabbit holes. I mean, yeah. again, as an adult, you know, I type something in thinking it's very you know yeah. innocent. It takes me somewhere. I'm like, what is this? And it, it, you know, it's, it's not hard to do. No, it's, it's correct. Yes. Definitely have those parental controls mm -hmm. and definitely have those monitoring devices. Yeah. Um, so that you know where your child is going, because mm -hmm. even the best child can make mistakes, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so and we do as adults, you know. And yeah. So definitely those controls are needed in addition to knowing mm -hmm. the maturity level of your child, um, because it's just that extra tool to, to help curtail where you yeah. want them to be. You help that, that boundary be erected. So, um, and there's, you know, on our phones, we have controls. On our tablets, there's controls. Even with YouTube, there's controls. Um, but again, outlining what the expectation is from the very beginning is so key for parents to do um, and not just give your child free reign to yeah. use technology according to how they want to. Yeah. And you, like you said earlier, they want and need boundaries. We yeah. have to do that. Their brains aren't equipped to say, I'm going to set, they're not there. So that yeah. has to be us doing it. Right. Oh, D, this has been, I swear, I, I, I could just keep you here all day, but I know you are a busy <laughs> lady. This has been so, I have learned so much. And again, professionally, personally, I think I'm so glad that you followed your gut and decided to to take this, you could have easily just said, Oh, this is weird. I'm seeing this over and over. Well, whatever. But you took it and you <laughs> created something out of it that is so beneficial. And I just think it's only going to become more beneficial as it technology is not going anywhere. It's here. No. It's you cannot unring that bell. And like you said, there's a lot of great benefits from it. It just, you know, in moderation. So mm -hmm. how can listeners, um, again, we're going to put your website and information what are some of the, you've got the unplug to connect. What else, um, what else would, would somebody be able to get from you, your services sure. or from your site? 
So parents also, I work with parents in like different components of Mm -hmm. the program. So parents also come to me and just say, you know, I just really want training on knowing how to to judge better with shows. So I provide uh, coaching to parents too. I do one-on-one coaching, group coaching. Mm -hmm. Um, The Unplugged Connect is a cohort that I do a couple of times a year that the next one I'm going to be doing is going to be in the fall. I already have one that's going right now. And so, um, but I have parents that uh, will reach out to me and I do one-on-one coaching with them. I do, I train on components, just small components of that program. So they can reach me and find me in at my website. Um, and then also provide trainings and workshops through schools and, and um, educational institutions like daycares. And so um, if you're a daycare owner and need a presentation and uh, trainings for your staff, I've done that as well. Um, but my website is spiritspeech.com. And then they can find me on Instagram and YouTube um, at Spirit Speech Consulting. And I have a parent Facebook group where I do trainings and provide um, um, tips and resources in that Facebook group. And it's also a community. It's about a community a community of 10,000 people. Wow. And so there's other moms in there that are mm-hmm. um, asking questions and helping each other out. And so that uh, Facebook group is called Intentionally Connected, Pro- Intentionally Connected Parenting on Facebook. Yeah. And we'll put all of that in the show notes. And just you know, want to wrap up by saying again, I'm so glad you do this. And one of the things that I really love is that you don't do this in a look at you, shame on you. It's in a, it's a warm, supportive environment where it's like, Hey, we're all humans. We're doing the best we can, but these are the things we now know. And so let's make some changes and then it will ultimately improve the outcomes for your child and for right. your family dynamics. So thank right. you so much, D. This was so informative and um, yeah, everybody go check out the website and uh, the social media and Instagram. And um, it's, uh, it's all really very well done. And um, so thank you for your time and your expertise. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed the discussion and the opportunity just to share my passion and help other parents, help other moms, help other SLPs as we also um, provide education to our, our parents. And so thank you so much for the opportunity. And that wraps up this episode. Thank you for tuning into SLP Full Disclosure. For more information about this episode, check out the show notes on our website at medtravelers.com slash SLP Full Disclosure. And don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe so you never miss a guest. Are you interested in becoming a travel SLP? Visit medtravelers.com to learn more and explore the exciting opportunities we offer at top level facilities across the country. Also, a special thanks to Jonathan Carey for producing this episode and Aiden Dykes for the music and editing. And as always, this episode was powered by Med Travelers. See you next time.